Hi guys, and welcome to a, another episode of my Getting Into TV series. On this episode, I am joined by um, Cynthia Satole. Hi! <laughs> who is a casting researcher. We, we met, I think, three years ago? Do you know, I don't even know what years are because of COVID, but I think so. That sounds about right. <laughs> um, it's the only time we've met. Um, but I just, yeah, I just thought it'd be really nice to have, to have a conversation with you because I feel like we both started off wanting to go a drama way. Yeah. And now we've both gone into, well, we're both going into a casting research job. So I just thought it'd be a really nice conversation to have with you. Thank you for joining me. Oh, you're welcome. And I'm excited. <laughs> I feel like this conversation has been like long coming. But hopefully we can do some good and help some people. So yeah, um, my first question really is, what is your current or most recent job? So my most recent job, like literally, like finished so soon, um, was casting researcher on a CBBC show, oh, which is going to be very exciting um, when it comes out. It was a lot of fun, um, but it was also quite interesting because it's a role. I've never worked in kids before, um, so that's my first ever working in kids TV. I suppose really a better place for us to start is what's your journey been like? and getting to where you are, getting to be a casting Because like I said at the start, we'd obviously met um, on the screen skills training um, for the open day, um, yeah. really. Um, so yeah, what's it been like since, or up until then and then since then, what's your story? Oh God, I, th I feel like it's been three different stories. So I obviously I finished university end of 2015 um, and then I just wanted a bit of a break. So I moved back home. And in that time for a year, I didn't think about TV. I didn't think about anything like that. Um, and then from 2015 to about 2017, um, mm. I was kind of applying um, to jobs, but a lot of the stuff at the time was in London. Um, so I was, I was finding my work experience or any jobs were London related. So I had to really make the decision of, do I really want to move to London? Like I don't, I don't have savings. I don't have connections, like I'm pretty much fresh out of uni, like what do I do sort of thing. Um, and then I, I did get a placement, I think it was Fremantle Media, they do like a, a weekly uh, scheme, I think in summer. Mm -hmm. um, so I did get on that and I have to get my dates right because it's been so long, but I think it was about 2016 yeah. that I got onto that. Um, and that was, that was quite a good experience because it, you picked a department you wanted to learn about, which at the time was production um and you get paired with a buddy so I really appreciated that and each day it was something else it was like learning about finance learning about casting things with buddies especially I think are really good because you can have that you, ha you have that you feel like you actually are able to ask the questions you know because I, I remember when I first started out I was a bit nervous to ask the questions I yeah. say that on my videos just ask questions but I, I know that when I started it was I didn't want to I didn't want to seem like I didn't know anything yeah but I think, yeah I think looking for a buddy scheme is definitely a really good way to get in yeah yeah and you hit the nail on the head there like it was I was so scared to ask anything and I was so scared to like like you say to look like I didn't know anything yeah you want to look like oh well you know you get that ego boost I've done three years of uni I know what I'm doing no you don't <laughs> you no. absolutely don't you leave uni and you're basically coming out in the exact same position just probably with a weaker um, liver because of alcohol poisoning or something <laughs> yeah. yeah I did work experience for about the first sort of two years out of uni um Fremantle did ask me back to do another week on Boundless their sister um company in London the HQ and that was actually the first time I'd ever done logging. But yeah, like it was an interesting experience doing that for mm -hmm. founders. I felt, I don't know, I just felt like I was doing everything wrong. I, like I wasn't, it's finding that balance between being a good like runner and asking questions, yeah. but also not bombarding people and like the yeah. whole hierarchy of things. It's just so confusing. So I was really trying to balance that, that thing of, of trying to learn but also trying to look really competent um and I think I think one definitely for me starting out and I, I suppose it, we, I kind of mentioned earlier but that thing of not wanting to ask questions because they want to look stupid it was just kind of I think when you're starting out there's just always that worry there's always that undertone mm. uh, of, of, of of just looking stupid so yeah no um yeah 
it was yeah. terrifying, terrifying. <laughs> um, so then after that, I was like, you know, you get that boost, like, oh, I've done a bit of work experience and you feel like you're getting somewhere. Um, and then reality crashed. I, like, I didn't hear anything from them for a few months. Um, I didn't have any, like I was sending CVs out all the time, joined all the Facebook groups. And I was like, this time I'm going to do, I'm going to get it nothing happened for ages I, was, I had that sort of deflated feeling again so then I think in 2017 I was I made the decision of I need to move somewhere that has you know stuff from coming so that's when I moved back to Manchester um, and I got a job at like a little like telesales company um, in Media City um, and then again nothing happened like I just felt really deflated again so I was like well I'm I'm at that point I need a full-time job like I can't be doing stints here and then I can't afford to work for free um so that's when I got a job in recruitment um later in 2017 um again didn't hear didn't hear anything for ages and ages I worked for about a year in recruitment um but then there's always that itch even though you're like I'm going to give up I'm going to give up now there's always that oh you watch a really cool tv show or and you just want to do it. Yeah. Yeah. You're just like, yeah. you're living my life. I want to, yeah. you know, I want to be doing that thing. Um, so again, I was like, I'm going to bite the bullet. I left the recruitment job, had no plans whatsoever. N- no one had contacted me, with me about TV work. Um, so I was just pretty much like, this is a massive risk. You've just said you need a full time job and you've just quit again. So it was a bit stressful. Um, but then I got on to doing a bit of work experience for Crew North at the time. Um, and again, that one was, I, I was interested in production side of things. And it was very apparent that I was absolutely rubbish at it. Like, <laughs> so I don't know what it was. I was inputting, I don't remember what it was. I was inputting like receipts or something on a spreadsheet. Um, and I was just like, no, this is not, this is not for me. I mean, everyone, everyone gets like the, the, I feel like everyone starts off doing something that they don't realize is going to be the start of the kind of trage- tra- trajectory. I suppose really that brings us on to the next question of what is a logger? Once a production's filming, you get the rush, they get the rushes and they upload them to a system and we watch the clips and pretty much verbatim type what the contributors are saying on screen. Um, and it's categorized in, in like a system. So for example, if they want you to transcribe just, I don't know, like a car trip, or um, for example, when I was on forward to bed, it was transcribing the payment day or whatever it is, um, you categorize it and then the edit producers have a look. It just makes it so much easier for them to find what they're looking for mm-hmm. rather than watching hours upon hours of clips. They can just have keywords that they can look at and think, okay, that will work for this. And each clip is time coded so they know exactly where to look. Um, so that's what it is, essentially. You, tra- you, you transcribe what people are saying. I, I always see jobs for login on Talent Manager or on Facebook and everything. And just before we move on, is what advice would you give to someone that's never done logging before? What, what, what are their top tips to be a good logger? Number one, resilience. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> honestly I mean obviously it depends on how long you're logging for but um I would say the number one thing is resilience and try and make it fun and yeah. like be enthusiastic about it because it, it is it is long you know <laughs> it is there's no way of sugarcoating it but if you make it fun if you get interested in what's actually going on um in terms of the contributors you find yourself sucked in really like in in the story and then you find yourself asking questions of Ooh, I wonder how they're going to cut this down. And so I think the, the best way of going about it is just get engrossed. It could be like yeah. the most dull, I don't know, news ask, news thing you have to transcribe, but just find ways of making it fun. You mentioned that it helped you realise that you enjoyed casting. Mm. And, and I'm going to also ask you this question from a personal side, because I'm going to be going into casting my next job. And I feel like I get it. Um, but basically, for my own benefit, what is a casting researcher? What do they do? And what are the top tips that you can give me? Okay, so a casting researcher is essentially the person who's responsible, or the first point of call with finding the contributors. Um, and it depends on which show that you're on. There's usually 
a casting researcher. Uh, there's usually an assistant producer and a casting producer to manage the team. Um, so essentially, it's making sure you're picking up the phone, going to applications and finding the right people to be on, on that show. Um, but there's usually the way that casting works, there's usually a sort of initial phone call or like an initial mm -hmm. application. And then from then, there will be like usually an audition or an interview of some kind that the usually the assistant producer is the one responsible for sorting or editing. And um, once that's cut down, it usually goes to the casting producer and they kind of make decision then. Um, obviously it still has to go through like the execs and the commissioners, uh, but in a nutshell, just to streamline it, that is sort of how the process works with, with casting researching. Um, and then compare it to the show that I've just finished on, people were applying for that. Um, so I didn't have to, be targeting or ringing around as much we've already got um, the people. yeah we've already got yeah. the people so with that the casting producer he would watch the videos that people have already submitted and then uh, go based on that would sort of divvy up and think okay we need to be contacting mums this week because we're lacking mums in I don't know a lower economic area or we need to contact dads from the north whatever it is um so it's really interesting, depending on what job you go to, but in essence, you are going to be the contributor's like best friend. <laughs> Quickly moving on to uh, trainee schemes. Like I've mentioned, um, we both, um, the, we met on the Screen Skills High End TV. Uh, it was a TV training finder, yeah. wasn't both of us, yeah. yeah. And we met on that, um, God knows when it feels like. A long time ago but it probably wasn't and um, pre it was pre-covid anyway um how, how how have you found how did you find being on the scheme and have you been on any scheme since or before that helped you so the first scheme i was ever on was the um it was another screen skills one i think it was screen yorkshire boot camp um mm -hmm. and that was for three days um mm -hmm. that was really interesting because it was essentially They'd have guests from different departments um, come and have conversations with us and, and talk to, to us about what they do. So, you, you know, you'd have someone in costume come and speak to us or the FX department and we'd have them showing us FX, in, in, you know, in, in the back, like setting off fireworks or how to how they made rain that was really cool how they, do they make it? rain because i've heard I, what the story i heard and i don't know if i believe it or not is it true that they put milk in with the water and then that's how they do it or have i just been told some complete made-up story that i believe probably for a long time i don't think that's right but the, but the one that i saw they, they have like it's like a it looks like a rainfall shower is it is it literally just water uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure it's just water. Why have we told you milk? I'm a bit worried. And then afterwards, I did the, the same scheme as you, where we met. Um, I found that it was an interesting one. because I feel like it was a similar experience. Yeah, yeah. It, it was good. It was really good in terms of training. Like, I, I got first aid training. Um, the talks we had, like, the finance stuff, that blew my mind, because I, I didn't even know what under the umbrella of free no, exactly. there's one thing that i even though i i never got any work from it i will say that i think that maybe the first aid that they gave us i think maybe having that certificate maybe benefit me in some situations mm -hmm. but in terms of like finances and stuff they also did like a a catch-up second tax thing halfway through the year and that really helped because i got made to become a freelance whilst well, go self-employed and then having to do all of my like uh self-assessments mm -hmm. so actually having that um because that, that that that's a that that, that would have been like a, a whole day thing that i'd have never done if i wasn't on that scheme so yeah there's definitely perks to it yeah yeah it's a shame um because again and this is you know more down to me like i don't drive and the department i wanted to be on at the time was um the production office side of things um but i think I, it was my own bitterness and disappointment as well that I, I didn't get anything on the scheme but it's completely understandable if you want to be on the production side of things it makes sense like you'd be able to drive because that's where you start off usually in, as a production runner um but I, I just wish there was things like shadowing or something that's office based that definitely i mean just before we go on i just want to say that 
even though neither of us got jobs on the scheme, I know a lot of people that did get jobs on the scheme. Yeah. So please don't screen skills if you're watching, please don't think that they are <laughs> slamming you and saying you're really bad because you're not. Um, I do know a lot of people. I think it is just like you say, it comes down to personal experiences. I just want to move on to my next question. Obviously, talking about traineeships um and not being able to drive, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. There's also loads of other issues with the industry in terms of um, ethnicity, sexuality, and, and gender pay gaps and everything. So the Time Project, I don't know if you follow them on Twitter, um, but they did a report um, for months where you could just put in your time, the hours you did, and they'd work out how much you'd get paid, et cetera. And they found that the greatest gender pay disparity occurred among, among women aged 20 to 29 who earned 39% less than men the same age. And like, wow, it's, yeah. It, it, it's just things like that, that even though it's a great industry that we work in, there's so much we could, I don't understand why, why things like this still happen. But it, this just brings me on to my next question is, what do you think could or should be done to tackle diversity in this industry? This is just from my just observation. Um, for example, when I did do work experience in London, I was like a light bulb went off. I think I literally saw a handful of like black men and women in, in high positions. So I think that first of all, that's the problem. There's not enough execs, there's not enough um, you know, series producers, people on the high end of the spectrum. Um, and as I think it's amazing that there's, you know, schemes like Creative Access um, and, you know, pages like Black and TV who talk about disparity and talk about how the industry could improve. Um, but it seems that a lot of schemes are junior level um, yeah. or entrance level, but then there isn't a retention and there isn't a, a nurturing. It's kind of like, oh, look at us, we're super diverse. And then you never, like, see these people come back. You never mm -hmm. see them hiring more Black people again when hashtag BLM has ended, you know what I mean? So I think it needs to be from the top down because that's Definitely. where the decisions are made. Um, and I, I just, I've heard stories of, you know, a friend of mine who's said that there's been a pitch meeting where it was one specific white male um and he greenlit a show that should not ever see the light of day um but it's like why why are like development teams still very much all all white or or you know cis or or able like why that's the see i think there's this fear of having like all black teams or having more diversity i, I don't i don't know it's just it's so I interesting i i definitely agree i i like I said, I and I, I I just find it really sad that on any production that I've worked on, I can't think of anyone that's been non-white, basically. Um, and it's, I I definitely agree with the fact that it needs to start from the top down. It, it needs to have fill them exec roles and needs to start filling them production management roles because, like you say, the, the people will just fall out. Even though I am a gay man, I do think that the industry is relying upon just being like oh look we've got a gay people but mm. it's just it's just gay men i think the bigger picture is 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 i don't know how to word it is people just they, there needs to be more diversity in everything yeah. in the yeah. fact that i i notice the fact that my privilege is the fact that i'm white is and the fact that i'm even though i'm a gay man i'm still a white gay man mm. um and that puts me above, I feel, someone that identifies as either trans or a lesbian, and it shouldn't. Mm. Um, so that, that, that's just my, I don't know where I was going with that. My brain just <laughs> kind of went, and I knew what I wanted to say. Um, it feels like that there's kind of a, a kind of like a one in, one out kind of rule. Yeah, that's, I think um, that's what I'm trying to get at, yeah. Yeah, so it's like, oh, well, you know, we've, we've had the, the gay men now, your time's done, like, now it's time for, like, black people, or, Oh, the fame. I hate that term. Like, I hate that term with a passion. Um, so yeah, but I think what I struggle to understand is why can't it just, we need people. Even though there is some progress, it still feels like 
it's a very a white centric lens where whether it's really casting or whether it's your hiring crew it just still feels like white and others you know so the company that I've just left oh god bless them they're absolutely incredible like I think it was me two other black girls um another black guy and one of the presenters is black so it, like when I came into it I was like oh my god this is like incredible um but they actually nurture they hadn't like an That's exit amazing. meeting they you know they had funding from um like a bbc diversity scheme who actually do a follow-up on how was your experience um and i know sure you know they hired based on diversity but i think that they also hired because yeah my CV slaps <laughs> do you know what i mean yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so and that's how it should be, and hopefully, yeah. hopefully, one day we can be in a world where that that is the norm. Like we hire people just because their CV slaps. With my experience as well, I remember having a conversation with a friend of mine um, mm. who's South Asian, um, mm. and we were talking about blind submitting of CVs, mm. so removing surnames or using. A more English sounding name and I find it interesting that even though at the time it was very early stages I wasn't really getting any work anyway mm-hmm. it felt like I was getting more responses even though there were rejections which I find very interesting um but it's, it's the thing these are the things that unfortunately we have to go through as um black people Asian people you know mix of ethnicity people is con- con- constantly centering yourself or, or, or tweaking who you are in the hopes that you'd get the job and then when you when you get the job you're then in a office or a culture where you don't feel like you're seen or you don't feel like you you listen to really so um it's been such a breath of fresh air the company oh where God. I was at that I wasn't the only one I literally wasn't the only one um and they genuinely cared about you know me like- coming back etc and I think the whole idea of nurturing talent as well is something that I feel like the industry is getting better at nurturing talent. Um, but yeah, I think that's something that we need to get better at, just nurturing people and making yeah. them progress so they don't fall out, so they can become a researcher, so they can become a producer, and they can tell them stories. Mm-hmm. Because at the end of the day, what's the point in making TV if you're just going to tell one story? Until you start hiring people in higher up positions, like you said, them stories are never going to be told. And I feel like our industry will be worse off until that happens. And I feel like culture as a whole in the country will be worse off until that happens because Mm -hmm. until you have in non-binary people or black people telling authentically black stories or authentically non-binary stories, then that you're not, you're not telling, you're not accurately, accurately representing people. Before we finish, I just, my final question really is what advice can you give to new entrants um obviously I mean I I one thing that always annoys me is when for instance one of my lecturers actually said this to me um that you should be a runner for a year and then after that year you shouldn't be a runner anymore you should progress straight away like that and I think that's wrong I think that I I I think getting into this industry can just take as long as it possibly can for instance I interviewed Pete Levy and he was saying he did he, he went to the army for a bit and then he came into the industry a lot later than he, he, like he never planned to go into the industry, but came into a, a, the industry late. I've worked with runners that are in their forties. My advice would be is don't feel like you need to rush it. Hmm. What about what about yourself? I'd agree with that. I'd say one, don't rush it, and and for me, I think it was more don't compare. Your your journey in this industry is, is unique to yourself, and I think we are, we have to remember there's certain factors that might stop you progressing in 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 a year like for for me like I didn't drive so it's been a bit slower or I've been in the I work in the north and there's not as many job opportunities as there has been down south so I think you've just got to remember it's what you make of it have a goal that you want to at the end and it might take you three years it might take you 10 years to get to that point but just enjoy it and embrace it and like what your lecturer said also annoys me as well because sometimes you have to you could progress and get to a level but sometimes you got bills to pay and you're gonna have to take yeah, a step down 
like, like you know when I first went freelance I I, I'd been in a comfortable post-production house job for nine months, decided I got the screen skills thing and I was like, right, let's go freelance. It was a stupid decision. Um, <laughs> and then it goes around about October. I didn't like the odd job and I'd managed to survive. But then all of a sudden there was no work because naturally there's no work over Christmas, really. Um, and I had to go to the Odeon. And, yeah, it was the most it was soul destroying because I just spent a whole year and a half doing what I loved. Mm. Um, and I had to face reality and be like I've got bills to pay if I want to actually stay here and actually be in it with a chance of continuing what I want to do I've got to stick it up for about three months mm. um, so mm. I'd agree I'd agree with you yeah yeah and touching on that as well um in terms of jobs and and the the freelance life it, it's it's simultaneously one of the best decisions I've made but also terrifying because I love that I have the freedom if like if I don't want to work for a month I'm not going to work for a month um Sometimes it doesn't align and there's no work, but I think it's always you've got to think ahead, like think, okay, I'm coming towards the end of my contract. I should probably start applying for other things or I should, if I can, obviously I'm at a position now financially, I'm, I, you know, I've look, been lucky enough to get steady work mm. and, you know, put away a bit of savings to ensure that when it is dead and quiet in winter or whenever, then I can have that pot to survive on. Um, but it is just always thinking ahead but even if you don't get anything for it there's no shame in going back to a waiting job or you know doing a little well, quite often, waiting jobs are really vital to being a good runner I think as well yeah. and obviously be, being a runner is, is kind of the start point for most people um or even even as I think and imagine as a casting researcher because as a waiter or work in hospitality you have to pretend to like people yeah. um, you have to talk have to have to have these conversations so yeah these jobs may not be what you want to do but I think you look you, you gain them skills that will exactly. never help you down the line exactly and I'd say as well for new entrants um who have come from nothing on their CV to do with TV, but you've come from again waitressing or whatever it is. It's so valuable. Like mm -hmm. people will look at those skills and think, okay, you're good at being on your feet, you're good at problem solving, you, you're resilient, you're good at you know speaking to people. Um, so don't ever feel like, oh, you know, I've not I've not had a degree or I've been at the industry for it. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because once you're in, you figure it out. We're all yeah. still figuring it out. Like, yeah, you, I'm, I've been in it four years and I'm just still like, I don't, I don't know think my next I'm step ever going to stop figuring it out. Um, thank you so much for talking to me today. Um, is there anything that I haven't asked that you'd like to just touch upon or is there anything you'd want to say? I don't think so, no. I think we do need to return and have a more spicy chat about <laughs> Diversity. We do. We <laughs> do. I want to make it its own video. I just think it, it deserves to be its own thing rather than just thrown into the corner of something. Thank you so much for watching. If you have any comments for either of us, please comment them down below and I'm sure I'll try and answer them. Um, and just follow all of the social media to keep up to date with brand new videos. And if there's any video requests that you'd like to make or any questions you have about certain job roles, please again comment them down below and I'll see what I can do. But yeah, thank you so much, Cynthia. Welcome. Bye. Bye.